Today I would like to speak to you on the subject going from ordinary to extraordinary. But Maximum Impact Club listeners, before I do that, I just want to let you know I'm in Orlando, Florida, and I'm with my friend, the Goads. I'm at Goad International Headquarters, and you know that I have a wonderful relationship with the Goads. They're like family to me. And I'm also with Ron and Georgia Lee per year, and I'm so excited to be with them and Worldwide Dream Builders. Let me tell you a little bit about this organization. Ron and Georgia Lee, 30 years ago, started out to build a business to add value and help people. And one of the things I like about this organization is that they have produced people just like them. They have produced people who have a heart to help people. They've produced people who want to make a difference. They have produced people who want to add significance and value to other people. When I think of Ron Perrier, when I think of Georgia Lee, I think of people of integrity. I think of people who absolutely have committed their life to significance and people who truly do want to make a difference. And so as I do this lesson tonight, I'm going from ordinary to extraordinary, I really dedicate it to them because truly they have gone from ordinary to extraordinary. And we're going to talk about how you, not only those in the room, because we have a couple hundred leaders from this wonderful organization who have come in here together and they are learning together, growing together. Not only do I have them, but I have you as a listener, the Maximum Impact Club listener. And I just want you to get ready to take some notes and I want you to get ready to grow and I want you to get ready to go to a next level. So let's get right into the lesson right now. If you want to go from ordinary to extraordinary, number one, you're going to need a little extra effort. Just a little extra effort. You're just going to have to do a little bit more. In fact, do you see the quote in your notes? The person on the top of the mountain didn't fall there. <laughs> did you ever see somebody on the top? How did you get there? Was there an escalator on that mountain I didn't see? I mean, did you take a helicopter? How, how did you get there? Several years ago, I did a tape, a lesson called Going to the Top. And in that lesson, I talked about how do you get to the top. And, and one of the things I said is, if you want to get to the top, you have to get up to go up. Because <laughs> I know a lot of people that they've never gotten up yet. You know, <laughs> they, they think somebody should come along and carry them up to the top. And, and I said, if you want to get to the top, you have to give up to go to the top. And the higher you go, the more you have to give up. If you're going to be a mountain climber, what you don't do is get a whole bunch of gear and say, I'm going to take it to the top. No, you, you, you try to do as, take as little as you possibly can because you know that the higher you go, the less you can carry with you. A little extra effort in your notes. Ask yourself these questions and then listen seriously to the answers. What do I really want? What will it cost? Am I willing to pay the price? When should I start paying the price? Here's what Danny Cox said in his book, Leadership, When the Heat is On. If you don't answer the last question, let me get the last question in front of you again. When should I start paying the price? And make a commitment to, to a start date. The first three questions really do not matter. The best answer, of course, is now, achievers choose what losers won't and pay the price that others don't. The other day I heard that 91 million Americans every year make a New Year's resolution. Let me ask you a question. Just raise your hand. How many of you have ever made a New Year's resolution? Let me say, <laughs> oh, it looks like every one of you in this room have made a New Year's resolution. Now let me ask you another question. How many of you, after you made the New Year's resolution, a couple, three weeks later, had already left that resolution. Let me see your hands. Come on. Okay, good. I just, I, I, I knew you had good intentions with the first question. I just wanted to see if you were truthful with the second one. Here's what they say. 91 million Americans make a New Year's resolution every year, and 70 million Americans break it in the first week. A little extra effort is what it takes to be extraordinary. Go to your notes. The following challenge was issued in the 1992 graduating class 
at the University of South Carolina by Alexander M. Sanders, Jr., Chief Judge of the South Carolina Court of Appeals. Here's what he said. As responsibility is passed to your hands, it will not do as you live the rest of your life to assume that someone else will bear the major burdens, that someone else will demonstrate the key convictions, that someone else will run for office, that someone else will take care of the poor, that someone else will visit the sick, protect civil rights, enforce the law, preserve the culture, transmit value, maintain civilization, and defend freedom. You must never forget what you do not value will not be valued, that what you do not remember will not be remembered, that what you do not change will not be changed, and what you do not do will not be done. You can, if you will, craft a society whose leaders, business, and political are less obsessed with the need of money. It is not really a question of what to do, but simply the will to do it the will to do it. What's he saying? He's saying that if you and I want to go from ordinary to extraordinary, it's going to take a little extra effort in marriage. Do you know what the difference is between an ordinary marriage and an extraordinary marriage? My wife Margaret's here tonight. We've been married for 33 years. She's only 37. You know what, you know what takes a marriage from ordinary to extraordinary? A little extra effort. Do you know what? Do you know what takes a friendship? Do you know the difference between an ordinary friendship and an extraordinary friendship? A little extra effort. Do you know what the difference is in work between a person that does an ordinary job and someone that does an extraordinary job? A little extra effort. John Wooten, who is the greatest college basketball coach ever. I'm excited. I'm going to, in February, I'm I'm going to be out in California. I'm going to have breakfast with him, and we're going to talk. John Wooden said this quote in your notes, doing your best is more important than being the best. And every great accomplishment begun with a willingness to try, a little extra effort. As I look back on my life, I can tell you that I have some regrets because I didn't give that little extra effort. I can think back several years ago when the, in Berlin, when the wall was coming down in, in, in Berlin. And I, I remember talking to Margaret and, and, and saying to her, we need to get the kids on the plane because Margaret and I both have a huge love for history. I said, we need to get the kids on the plane. We need to go to Berlin. We need to watch them knock the wall down because this Iron Curtain is falling and this is, a, this is probably the greatest event in, in the last 50, 60, 70 years of American history. And we didn't do it. And I've always regretted. Just a little extra effort. Just a few extra days out of my calendar. And I could have held and cherished an event with my family that I would hold the rest of my life. And every one of us in this room know what it's like to, to come up to something. And, and if we just put out just a little bit extra effort, just a, an extra hour, one more thing. And we could have gone from ordinary to extraordinary. Number two, the second thing I would share with you of going from ordinary to extraordinary is a little extra time. A little extra time. My friend Peter Lowe said this. He said, the most common trait I have found in all successful people is that they have conquered the temptation to give up. That is a huge statement. I'll repeat it one more time. The most common trait I have found in all successful people is that they have conquered the temptation to give up. A little extra time. Perhaps you've heard me, if you've been in a conference of mine, talk about the fact that we overestimate what can happen in an event and we underestimate what can happen in the process. And when I'm teaching that, what I'm basically saying is too many of us put way too much stock in one meeting or one book or, 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 or one song or, or one lecture. And we kind of think that that one event will make us when that never does make us. It's the process. It's the time, the day in, day out, that we're willing to commit and spend that really makes the difference. That's why in my book on the 
It's one one irrefutable laws of leadership. I talk about the law of the process. Leaders develop daily, not in a day. Let me give you some thoughts about time. Thought number one. Wrong perception causes many people to quit. In fact, the moment that you say, I give up, someone else is seeing the very same situation where you just said, I give up, someone else is saying, this is my great opportunity. Isn't that true? One person's yelling uncle and getting out of the ring, and the other one saying, oh, this is my chance of a lifetime. It's our perception, wrong perception, that causes us many, many times to give it up. Number two, if you start for the wrong reason, you'll stop for the wrong reason. This is very true. When a person is going to stop something, I always want to know why they started. I can remember sitting down with a friend many, many years ago, and he said to me, because I was a pastor in my background and for many, many years had the joy of pastoring a church, and, and he, he looked across the table and he said, I'm going to give you five reasons why I'm going to quit the ministry. <laughs> I just started laughing. Well, I said, I can give you ten if you want. <laughs> I've never been impressed with somebody's reason why they're quitting. I can tell you, I've never seen a job that you didn't have a dozen reasons why you wouldn't want to quit. I could watch him as he just kind of backpedaled and, and he looked at me and he said, well, well then what would, you, what would you want to say to me? I said, I want to ask you a question. Why did you start the ministry? You've got to go back there. In fact, let me say this. Listen carefully. Before we get into five reasons why we want to quit something, how about going back and give me a good reason why you wanted to start something? If you have the right reason for starting something, you'll have the tenacity to give it a little more time. Number three, don't confuse slowing down with stopping. <laughs> I live in Atlanta, and uh, traffic's terrible. Traffic's terrible. And this summer, we were in a kind of a traffic jam, and you know how the ramp comes on the expressway. And on the ramp, there was a yield sign. And there was a lady that was just stopped. She was just stopped. I mean, and everybody's behind her, and people are honking. And I'm saying, I'm saying, she can't hear me, but I'm saying to her, lady, it says yield, not give up. <laughs> Don't surrender. You see, there are a lot of times we get tired and we have to slow down. Isn't that right? There are a lot of times we have to kind of take a break. I'm not talking about that. Understand the difference. Don't confuse slowing down with stopping. Number four. Perseverance and patience are a result of seeing the big picture. How can you and I persevere and be patient? It's because we see the big picture. Let me explain. The stonecutter, with his hammer and chisel, continually pounds and pounds and pounds. And as you watch the stone, there, there is no obvious change in the stone, but he keeps tapping the chisel. And on the what, 101st, 102nd, 103rd try, all of a sudden, here comes the hairline crack. It would be foolish for us to say that it was the 102nd blow that caused the crack. It was the continual hammering on the chisel that allowed the crack to happen. Now, you see, that sculptor has the big picture. He has the big picture. Some of us, we hit that chisel about three times and we give up. We're saying nothing's happening. Can I tell you something? When you're doing the right thing daily, something's happening even when you can't see it.
And only people with a big picture persevere. Number five, great accomplishments take great time. It just takes time to do something great. George Buffon said, Genius is nothing but a greater aptitude for patience. <laughs> Let me give you two realities concerning time. I was playing golf with a wonderful friend the other day, and he was, he was talking to me about in his business things were not going as well as he wanted it to, and, and I could tell that he was a little impatient and quite a bit frustrated. And I shared with him what I'm going to share with you now in your notes because there are two realities concerning time. There are the things that we work for, and there are the things that we wait for. And we have to understand the difference between what do I work for and what do I wait for. And waiting is not easy for us. It's not an American thing, is it, huh? In, 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 in a country that where two industries thrive, fast food restaurants and fast weight loss clinics. <laughs> In fact, recently, I've been praying, God, teach me, teach me the difference between the things I work for and the things I wait for. They were interviewing the sculptor who did Mount Rushmore. And they asked him the question. They said, now, with those faces on that rock up there, did, did you do a, a, a perfect job of sculpture? And he said, no. He said, no. He said, the, um, the nose of George Washington is about an inch too long. But it's okay. In a thousand years, erosion will make it just right. <laughs> That's patience. That's learning to wait for some things. Statement number six. Some things only work out if given enough time. Some things only work out when, when given enough time. I was reading in Golf Magazine recently the story of Sam Snead where a guy was talking about playing golf with him. And, of course, Sam was such a great golfer. And on the first hole, he, did a, he, he made a triple bogey, three over par. But he seemed very unruffled, and as he was walking off the green, he looked at his partner and said, that's why they have 18 holes of golf. Oh. That's why they've got 18 holes. It, it, it'll, it'll work out. Be patient. It takes time. <laughs> Number three. If you want to go from ordinary to extraordinary... You and I need a little extra help. We need a little extra help because we, we are not going to be able to do it by ourselves. And you see the quote there, if you see a turtle on top of a fence post, you know he had help getting there. <laughs> Can I tell you something? I'm a turtle on a fence post. Didn't get here on my own. I'm not that good, not that fast, not that smart, not that gifted. And what I have found, the difference between ordinary people and extraordinary people, is those who hit extraordinary, they had help getting there. They didn't do it on their own. I can think back as a young man when I was pastoring and Margaret and I wanted to have some kind of financial secure future and... Um, with the income that I was making in the pastorate, it just really wasn't going to happen. And I had an opportunity to invest a, a, in a partnership in a nursing home. And again, we didn't have enough money to, to invest, nor did I have enough probably good credit at that time or a big enough salary to get the money that I needed. And I remember I went to a friend of mine. Skip Elmore was his name. And I said, Skip, here's my opportunity. And he was financially blessed and and I was able to help him get into the partnership himself. And, and I remember he loaned me the money. And I remember as, as that investment started paying off, Margaret and I never took a penny. We, we, tithed, we tithed off of what was happening without taking the money out. And we just kept putting it back into his hands until we paid it completely off. 
And then, and then I was able with that one to, to go to a bank, and, and I was able to get my next loan. And, and then I was able to meet the vice president who said to me, John, I'm going to work a portfolio up for you for the next five years. And he said, we're going to help you with this. And, and he said, it's going to be in five years. All you got to do is pick up the phone, and, and you'll, you'll have your money at any time. Keep your record good. P- pay your bills on time. And I paid them on time and a little bit extra. And let me tell you something. When God blessed us and we began to have other opportunities in nursing homes, Margaret and I realized... We would never got there without somebody giving us a little extra help. And think about it. Think about you. Think about the fact that not only would you get there without somebody giving you a little extra help, but think about the privilege that you and I have of giving other people extra help to help them get there too. That's the way life should be. When, when, when you have been blessed by someone else, don't, don't be a reservoir. Be a river. Pass it on. Share. Add value to someone else. Let me share with you in your notes the kind of help that helps me. Number one is opportunity. It's just wonderful in your business when you're able to provide and share someone else what a wonderful opportunity they have to go from ordinary to extraordinary. And I love this statement. An opportunity is never lost. It's just passed on to someone else. Number two, advice from the right people. I've had a lot of help because I've had good advice from a lot of good people. And by the way, there are two ways to disaster. (laughs) Number one is take nobody's advice. Boy, I know people like that. They just don't listen to anybody. that's That's a sure highway to disaster. And number two is take everybody's advice. (laughs) <laughs> you see, the answer is not nobody, or the answer is not everybody. The answer is the right people. So in your notes, who are the right people? People who have success and experience in the area that you need help. People who have unconditional love for you. People who have good thinking skills. I like this next statement, people who have nothing to gain by your choice. And finally, people who are unemotionally involved in your situation. And Cyrus was exactly right when he said, many receive advice, but only the wise profit from it. And I would just say this before I go on because we talked about a little extra help. Georgia Lee and I were talking about this over dinner. Now, I know you wouldn't know this to look at her, but, but we've put a few years on us now. And we talked about the fact that the older you get, it just seems like life goes faster. And it, it's, it's almost at this stage where you're almost in a panic. You say, I've got I've to pack as much in as I possibly can. And we were talking about it. Margaret leaned over and she said, did you tell her the toilet paper deal? And I, and I laughed. I said, I had. You see, I've always compared life getting older to toilet paper. The closer you are to the end, the quicker it goes. I just want to say this before I go to number four, because I'm talking about a little extra help. The longer I live, the more I listen and the more I'm grateful. I want to listen more because I want to learn. It's the only vehicle of learning is listening. And I want to be more grateful because I'm that turtle on a fence post. I didn't get there on my own. Well, let's review it for a moment. To go from ordinary to extraordinary, we need a little extra effort, a little extra time, a little extra help. Let's go to number four. We need a little extra realism. We need a little extra realism to go from ordinary to extraordinary. Max Dupree said the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. Now, let me just stop here for a moment and give a confession. This is very difficult for me. This has been a weakness for me. This is not my strength. I've always been a dreamer. I've always been a person who looks on the positive side. I've always been a person who had great hope. 
I don't have many emotionally down days. This has been a weakness of mine. This is something I've had to learn in my last few years. This is something I've had to, I've had to kind of grab hold of because I realized that, um, that too often I wasn't realistic. Sometimes I would look at my own strength or my own giftedness and think that everybody else could come along with me, and sometimes they could, and sometimes they couldn't. And I've had to back up. And about 12 months, 18 months ago, the good advice of Jack Welch really helped me. It's in your notes, six rules for successful leadership from the CEO, CEO, Jack Welch. Here's what he said. Number one, control your destiny or someone else will. To face reality as it is, not as it was or as you wish it were. Three, be candid with everyone. Four, don't manage lead. Five, change before you have to. And six, if you don't have a competitive advantage, don't compete. That stuff grabbed me because all of a sudden I realized I needed to face reality as it was. Not as I wanted it to be, not as I thought it should be, not as it was. Just what is real. That's the solid ground to stand on. I have a book that will be coming out in April called Thinking for a Change. It's in your notes. 11 Ways Highly Successful People Approach Work and Life. Basically, the book is about 11 ways that successful people think that unsuccessful people don't think because the thesis of the book is the greatest difference between successful and unsuccessful people is how they think. Oh, my goodness. And in the book... I have a chapter on realistic thinking. And I just want to take a moment and just, just carve out one little part of that chapter. Go to your notes. What is your natural bent? Is it toward optimism or realism? Take a look at the phrases that I went through in my evolution as a more realistic thinker, plus one more level that I have not yet achieved, and see which statement best describes where you are. And, and this, this was just my step. This is my journey. In the beginning, I do not engage in realistic thinking. I went to the next level. I do not like realistic thinking. Three, I will let someone else do realistic thinking. Four, I will do realistic thinking only after I'm in trouble. I worked on that mode for several years. Five, I will do realistic thinking before I am in trouble. Oh, there's a thought. Six, I will continually make realistic thinking a part of my life. Seven, I will encourage my key leaders to do the same. Number eight, I will make realistic thinking the foundation of our business. Boy, I'm right there. That's where I am. Number nine, I derive certainty and security from realistic thinking. And then number ten, I rely heavily on facts and often make judgments according to the worst-case scenario. I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. It's just my journey. It may not be yours, but here's what I know. If you want to go to ordinary to extraordinary, you and I are going to have to come to grips with realism. Where am I right now? Because realism gives us a foundation we can build on. Here's the way I describe it. Realism is the foundation I build on, and my dream is the way that I soar to a new level. But I've got to have a foundation before I can soar. Number five, if I want to go from... Ordinary to extraordinary, a little extra change is needed. Max Dupree also said, we cannot become what we need to be by remaining what we are. So let me give you some change comments for your notes. Let's go. Number one, most people change enough, just enough, are you ready, to get away from their problems not enough to solve them. Isn't that true? They change just enough to escape. And as soon as they escape, oh, I'm okay. They, they, they don't change enough to solve their problems. They just change enough to get away from them. Number two, most people want to change their circumstances to improve their lives instead of changing themselves to improve their circumstances. <laughs> oh. You want to look at it again? Most people want to change their circumstances to improve their lives instead of changing themselves to improve their circumstances. I have leaders all the time come to me and say, John, 
Come on, John, give me some leadership stuff so I can change the people of my organization. <laughs> I'll be glad to give you some leadership stuff, but I'd like it to change you. Because if I can change you, your organization will change too. People do what people see. Look at number three. Most people do the same thing the same way and expect different results. I see it happen all the time. They keep doing the same thing the same way, and yet they expect something to get better. And I put it in your notes, when you want something you have never had, you have to do something that you have never done. Number four, most people are willing to change, not because they see the light, but because they feel the heat. <laughs> And because I'm speaking to leaders, not only leaders in this room in Orlando, but I'm speaking to leaders because the leaders take Maximum Impact Club taste because they want to become a better leader. Let me just say something. Like, let me listen to me very carefully on this. As a leader, you better change when you see the light. Because if you wait and change when you feel the heat, it's too late. Leaders go first. Sometimes we don't want to go first, especially in change. I'm sure Moses looked at God when he came to the Red Sea and those watery walls stood high. I'm sure he looked at God and said, why must I always go first? <laughs> Number five. Most people are unwilling to pay the immediate price of change. Therefore, they do not change and pay the ultimate price. If you and I don't pay the immediate price, we will eventually pay the ultimate price. Heard a cute story the other day from the post office. The post office sent a letter to a home and it came back to him marked to the person who sent it, he's dead. Of which somehow it got turned around the post office and they sent it back again and it got a few Days later, the envelope came back and said, he's still dead. <laughs> Number six. Most people see change as a hurtful thing that must be done instead of a helpful thing that should be done. How true that is. So let's review to go from ordinary to extraordinary, well, it takes a little extra effort, a little extra time, a little extra help, a little extra realism, a little extra change. Number six, a little extra thinking. Nightingale was right when he said, you are and you become what you think about. Look at this next statement. Your mind will give you back exactly what you put in it. <laughs> Have you ever heard anybody talk and they just didn't, nobody was home? Huh? I mean, they just talk and you just like, whoa, words are coming out, but not thoughts. <laughs> oh, we go. Words keep coming. Yeah, yeah. Word, a lot of words. No thoughts. Is there any oil in there? You see, there are a lot of people that are trying to make withdrawals and they've not made deposits. <laughs> so let me give you some things I've been thinking on. These are just things I've been thinking on the last seven days. I have a little, uh, a, a little notepad that I call my thinking companion. If you go back to where my briefcase is right down in the front, you could open it up and in my thinking companion, I have things that I'm thinking on. Just thoughts or quotes or ideas that I'm writing down and I'm thinking on. I keep my thinking companion always close to me so that every day I can renew those thoughts. And, and these are just thoughts I've thought on the last seven days. And I just thought I'd pass them on to you, such as difficulties. Here's one. I love this one on difficulties. A life that cannot be tested is a life that cannot be trusted. I was on the plane the other day with my friend James Davis. He gave me this one. God didn't promise us a, sm a smooth sailing, but he did promise us a safe landing. Here's one I picked up four days ago on authority. 
We should not be in authority until we've been under authority. Nothing's worse than a person that's in charge that's not accountable. Here's one on servanthood. Submission is not an act we put on, it's an attitude we have. Here's one on fruitfulness. Gifts are given, but fruit is developed. (laughs) I love this quote on opinion. I'd like to give this to a lot of people. Where I don't have responsibility, I don't need to have an opinion. (laughs) Oh, do I know people who need to know that one. Here's one on reputation. These are just things I've been thinking on. Just pass them on to you. Because you see, with a little extra thinking, you can go from ordinary to extraordinary. Here's one on reputation. What people see outside of me is my reputation with them. But what God sees inside of me is my reputation with him. Relationships. Never let the situation mean more than the relationship. Wow. Right now I'm trying to remember that. Never let the situation mean more than the relationship. Here's one on commitment. It's another name for success. Here's one on priorities. Priorities. A pre-decision about time. How am I going to spend my time? Here's one on goals. You've removed most of the roadblocks to success when you know the difference between motion and direction. I know all kinds of people, they don't have a clue. They're just motion, motion, activity, activity, no success. All right. A little extra effort, a little extra time, a little extra help, a little extra realism, a little extra change, a little extra thinking. Number seven, a little extra attitude. If you want to go from ordinary to extraordinary, come on, just give that attitude a little notch higher. You see, motivation in your notes determines what you do. Ability determines what you're capable of doing. Attitude determines how well you do it. Whenever I see a person that operates with excellence, I know it's because they have a good attitude. If you're a baseball fan, and especially if you love old baseball players, you know the name Stan Musial is one of the great left-hand swingers, the St. Louis Cardinals. A sports writer one day was in the locker room when one of the ball players came into the locker room, and there Stan Musial was sitting, just getting ready for the game. The player went up to Stan Musial and said, I've had a good day. My family's in good shape. He said, you know, I feel so good. I think I could get two hits today. He said, Stan, have you ever felt like that? And Stan said, every day. Every day. A little extra attitude. Jim Murray, when he was still alive and was writing those great sports columns, when the Olympics came to Los Angeles in 1982, said that the difference between gold medal winners and silver medal winners in all of the time events in the history of the Olympics was less than one-tenth of a second. He said, that's not ability. He said, that's attitude. And he closed that wonderful sports column that day in that Los Angeles paper by saying, Olympic potential gold medal winners You're just an attitude away. Going from ordinary to extraordinary. Number eight, a little extra planning. If you want to go from ordinary to extraordinary, a little extra planning. In your notes, 33% of American workers plan their daily schedules. 45% of American workers Make a plan once a week. Now are you ready? But only 9% complete what they planned. 
Daytimer survey says those in higher income brackets are more likely to make prioritized lists and follow through. Robert Elliott, professor of cardiology at the University of Nebraska, said it's important to run not on the fast track, but on your track. Pretend you have only six months to live and make three lists. The things you have to do, want to do, and neither have to do nor want to do. Then for the rest of your life, forget everything on the third list. Managers have as their goal to do things right. Leaders have as their goal to do the right things. Let's wrap it up. Let's look at our conclusion. If ordinary people gave a little extra effort, spent a little extra time, sought a little extra help, possessed a little extra realism, made a little extra change, exercised a little extra thinking, showed a little extra attitude, and did a little extra planning, they would become extraordinary. Thank you very much.